Good morning, ZPC. Good morning. It is good to see you all out here uh, this morning. We are so happy that you're here, and um, we would love to know that. So if you wouldn't mind texting that you're here, um, you can see there's the number on the front of the bulletin here um, where you can get that information. Um, you can also scan for the uh, electronic bulletin through the QR code and just easily click the link and it will let you know. So you can let us know that you're, that you're here as a regular attendee. If you're visiting and want to know more information, you can let us know that, uh, let us know that as well. Um, I spent a couple weeks ago, I was up here and, and spent time professing my love for the old school paper bulletin, but did want to point out that the QR codes has all of the links that are super easy to, to, uh, to get to. So if, as we talk through the announcements today and you see other classes or events you want to join, that's a great and easy way to do so. Our second ask for you today is to consider giving. Um, we, it's an important part of funding our mission. Over or almost a quarter of our funds uh, at ZPC go to missions. And so we uh, appreciate your generosity and consideration in supporting that. Um, and again, you can do that through online or, or in paper today as you, as you worship. Lastly, we have an exciting opportunity to build uh, for God's kingdom together as a church body uh, with helping with Rise Against Hunger. So we're putting together meals that will then go uh, to help with world hunger. Uh, we have three sessions. The first session is already full, but we have two afternoon sessions where you can come. It's a great family event. Uh, I'm bringing my family. We can do that together um, and would really encourage you to consider the, one of the second two sessions. And we have a booth out in the gathering space that you can uh, join and ask for more details. Now let's continue in worship. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. Can we all stand together as I read from God's word? It says in Proverbs 8, blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. And uh, as I shared at 8 o'clock this morning, I, I have so many thoughts about this passage as I've been thinking about it for the last couple of days. But what's really come up to my mind is this idea of listening. And I have an almost four-year-old daughter who... Uh, as I'm sure many of you parents are very aware that children don't like to listen. And it's a struggle that we're dealing with right now and we're trying to figure out how to just own the fact that our child is not going to listen to us. And one of the things that we've worked on is, okay, how can we change our language from, if you don't listen, this is the consequence, to if you listen, it will go well for you. And I'd love to say that it's worked out beautifully and swimmingly that she just all of a sudden does what we want her to do. But she, she does have some kind of a different posture when she hears something about good taking place. And that's what I want us to hear in this word is that there's a blessing upon us for listening, watching, and waiting for the Lord. And so as we, as we continue in our worship, let us not think that we have grown old and wise in our ways from the childhood of not listening we struggle to listen to our Heavenly Father. We struggle daily. Let it not guilt us or shame us into inaction or idleness, but instead, let us be drawn into his love and his goodness this morning. And as we think about him, let us wait and let us watch and let us listen for our Lord as we sing and as we hear his word preached this morning. to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for Come. 
your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever oh I could sing I could sing of your love forever Thank you to the worship team for leading us this morning. Before I 
begin in prayer. I wanted to let you know that we have some special guests here today. They're up in one of the Sunday school rooms right now. They should be in the gathering space, we hope, after the service. They're here from AWIMA, which is the Arab World Evangelical Ministers Association. And joining us this morning will be Maher and Violet and Diana. There's also going to be a lunch for them in the chapel at 1215 if you wanted to come back and be a late joiner for that. They are ministers from Egypt, and we support them through your generous uh, giving to the church that goes to our missions and then goes to these ministers from Egypt. So they're here all the way from Egypt today. If you see them in the gathering, uh, gathering space, please say hello again, Maher. Violet and Diana. And with that, let us pray. Most loving God, it is good to be in your house, in your sanctuary this morning. We were reminded again how deep the Father's love is for us. God, that we can share in that love in community in this place this morning. We read in your word what you are like. And God, we are called to be like you to live in similar ways that you teach us about. We read in your word to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. God, we are called in your word to live with grace, kindness, mercy, and compassion. So God, again, on this morning, help us to receive your grace, to receive your love, but not just to hold it, but to share it and to reflect that love to others. In this world, O oh God, we can often get tired or worn down. And yet, O oh God, we can be encouraged again by your love, your grace, and your mercy for us. So God, let us not be defeated by the world by suffering or weakness. But O oh Lord, in our suffering, help us to know that you walk with us, that you bring us comfort, and that you help us. God, in our weakness, we are reminded that we can depend on you as you are strong. As your people gathered in this place, not only do we bring you our praise and our thanksgiving, we humbly bring you our many requests as well. On this day, we do ask that you bless our friends from Egypt who are visiting here today, Maher and Violet and Diana. God bless their ministry in the Middle East, especially in Cairo, Egypt, where they serve. May their ministry be blessed and fruitful as they share your grace. Lord, as you know, it has been a difficult week for our church family, and so we also ask that you bless those in need. We continue to lift up those who need healing for Joe Mundell and Ken Miller. We pray for Steve Whipke, our church pianist, in the loss of his mother. Bless Steve. And we mourn the loss this week of three of the wonderful members of our church family. For Lisa Klingenpeel, who died last weekend, we thank you for Lisa's life and we ask that you bless Lisa's family. We mourn the loss of Ron Baker. And Lord, we ask your special blessings upon Ron's wife, Nancy, a beloved staff member for over two decades, and his children, Becca and Josh, and Josh's wife, Alicia. And Lord, since Friday, we also mourn the loss of Wanda Baker. Wanda, who was a, a founding member along with her husband, Leroy. God, may you bless Wanda to be with you and her two daughters who were left behind. God, Lisa and Ron and uh, Wanda were longtime loving members of this congregation. We thank you for the gifts that they brought to us. God, we do also want to thank you for the birth of Ethel Love to a newer family in our church, to Michael and Grace Love. Bless their young family, O Lord. So Lord, in our praises and in our needs, it is good to pray to you. And we conclude by praying together the words that Jesus taught, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Scott. We good? 
I'll just keep talking until we are. Good. Thank you, Mark. Well, it's good to be here with you this morning, and I hope that you've had a good weekend. From what I hear, autumn is on the way this week, and I, for one, am really excited about it. So uh, looking forward to that and looking forward to uh, something in two weeks that I want to talk about here before I begin uh, the sermon, which is uh, an unhurried life. Now, we've been talking about this a little bit. It's going to be led by Alan Fadling, and you may not know Alan Fadling, but uh, he's just a, a remarkable person, an author, um, and does a great work in kind of just talking through what does it mean for us to slow down. I, I told him at the 8 o'clock today, you know, I've been, I've been uh, on sabbatical, as many of you know, and so I kind of slow down, and you realize how fast everyone else around you is going whenever you slow down. It was a bit like when I ran cross country in high school. And, you know, when you're running in, in a race, you know, you, you, you can't tell how fast everyone's going because you feel like, you know, I mean, by and large, most of them are much faster than me, but you're still just kind of, you know, you're going. But then when I would stop, usually about 50, 60% of the way through a race and just walk because I was too tired, uh, you would notice then how fast everyone was flying by you, right? But you only noticed when you stopped, and so one of the things that we continue to want to talk about here is this importance. We have a culture uh, that is so fixated on speed and efficiency, and the way of the gospel is oftentimes a way that is much more steady, stable, and plodding. And so I encourage you to create the space in two Saturdays here. Uh, you can go out to the gathering space afterwards. There's a table there to be able to sign up for this really important part of the life of the church and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Well, we're continuing in our look at 2 Corinthians. This is the last week that we will be in 2 Corinthians. Next week we will be uh, in Galatians, but only for one week. These letters start to get a little bit shorter. And, uh, but before we uh, talk through, or uh, before I read through the scripture, kind of like I did last Sunday, I want to give you a little bit of context again, just to remind you of a couple of things that are going on here in the church in Corinth. So as Pastor Scott talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, well, let me say this first. Paul had gone and he was in Corinth. He had kind of started that church. He had helped the church to really grow. He had helped it to kind of understand what it means uh, to be a church that follows Jesus Christ, a church that is uh, a, a willing to be weak, a church that is vulnerable to others, a church that is serving, a church that is humble, a church that's not afraid to be sacrificial. And Paul, as people like Paul are apt to do, he gave it his all, right? He served them with every part of his heart, his mind, his body, his soul, everything. That's just kind of how Paul did things. So Paul was serving the church in this way, but of course he could only be there for so long because there were other regions that needed to hear the good news of the message of the gospel. And so he had, he had moved on. And in, in that time as he was away, there were some other preachers of the gospel who came around. Now these were, as, uh, as I think uh, uh, Scott talked about, these were super apostles, which I think is just great verbiage. These were super apostles. It's super apostles who were, who were eloquent in the way that they spoke. And, uh, and they had a real way of kind of, uh, of enamoring the people of Corinth who were in that particular church. They led with strength and with glamour, but not with vulnerability, not with sacrifice or servanthood. Paul, of course, was not very happy about that. And uh, so Paul began to tell them that this was not the way that it was, that rather than giving in to the culture as they clearly had begun to do, this church in Corinth, he wanted them to, to wake up, if you Will. And again, if you know Paul, you know that Paul's not just going to do this gently. Paul was not always the most gentle of people, right? That's why uh, uh, people who aren't gentle uh, naturally, like me, love Paul, right? He's, he's a bit of an excuse, uh, if you will. And so Paul wasn't going to take this lying down. And so he decided he was really, just to, to, to be kind of a, a, a crass about it, he was going to go off on them, right? Not, in, not because he was, well, he was mad, but, but, but out of a place of love. And so I'm reading today from the message, just as I, as I did last Sunday, because I think it gives us the tone and the tenor of what Paul was thinking as he wrote to the church in Corinth. I hope that you can hear it. Here's what Paul says in the 11th chapter. He says this, let me come back to where I started and don't hold it against me if I continue to sound a little foolish. Or if you'd rather, just accept that I am a fool and let me rant on a little. 
I didn't learn this kind of talk from Christ. Oh no, it's a bad habit I picked up from the three ring preachers that are so popular these days. Since you sit there in the judgment seat observing all these shenanigans, you can afford to humor an occasional fool who happens along. You have such admirable tolerance for imposters who rob your freedom, rip you off, steal you blind, put you down, even slap your face. I shouldn't admit it to you, but our stomachs aren't strong enough to tolerate that kind of stuff. And since you admire the egomaniacs of the pulpit so much, remember, this is your old friend, the fool talking, let me try my hand at it. Do they brag of being Hebrews, Israelites, the pure race of Abraham? I am their match. Are they servants of Christ? I can go them one better. I can't believe I'm saying these things. It's crazy to talk this way, but I started and I'm going to finish. I've worked much harder, been jailed more often, beaten up more times than I can count. And at death's door time after time, I've been flogged five times with the Jews, 39 lashes, beaten by Roman rods three times, pummeled with rocks once. I've been shipwrecked three times and immersed in the open sea for a night and a day. In hard traveling, year in and year out, I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by death desert sun and sea storm and betrayed by those I thought were my brothers. I've known drudgery and hard labor, many a long and lonely night without sleep, many a missed meal, blasted by the cold, naked to the weather. And that's not the half of it. When you throw in the daily pressures and anxieties of all the churches, when someone gets to the end of his rope, I feel the desperation in my bones. When someone is duped into sin, an angry fire burns in my gut. And if I have to brag about myself, I will brag about the humiliations that make me like Jesus. The eternal and blessed God and Father of our Master Jesus knows I'm not lying. Remember the time I was in Damascus and the governor of King Aretas posted guards At the city gates to arrest me, I crawled through a window in the wall, was let down in a basket, and had to run for my life. What a text. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for these words of Paul. Words that may not have been easy to write and certainly were not easy to hear. Whatever it is that your spirit would have us to hear today, may we do so. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. Could you feel it? Could you feel Paul? Could you feel his ire, his angst, his anger? Now, of course, much of it was focused upon these super apostles. These, as the message puts it, these egomaniacs of the pulpit. In earlier parts of the letter, we find that these super apostles Uh, they were uh, criticizing Paul. Um, uh, They were criticizing him, and and, and they were incredibly eloquent, these super apostles. They were remarkably charismatic. They were talking, as we hear earlier in the letter, about the miracles that they had done. One of the things that we need to know is that in Corinth, as in much of the Roman Empire, eloquence, being a good speaker, was highly sought after. What these preachers were really good at was figuring out what the culture was cultivating around them and then taking advantage of that in order to gain a following, in order to gain a hearing. They were drawn, the Corinthian church was, it seems, to their charisma, to their glamour, to their finely crafted words. In the first letter, to the Corinthians, Paul actually 
almost kind of, he, he understands this. And he says to them, look, first of all, he wasn't probably the greatest of preachers. I, this this uh, he tells us himself. But he says when he was there with them, he intentionally did not speak eloquently because he knew how that might woo them to think more about his eloquence and how good he was rather than the gospel. And that if, if they spoke and if he spoke in such a way that was so impressive and so powerful that it would diminish what he was trying to do, this message over here of the gospel of weakness and vulnerability and sacrifice and suffering. So how does Paul respond There's a lot of different ways to try to understand what Paul is doing here. I have my own kind of favorite way, which is that like we see in some other letters of Paul, he is struggling inside with exactly how to deal with these super apostles. Uh, He's struggling between his old life, his old self, and his new self in Christ, right? And the old self, of course, you know what Paul wanted to do, right? Paul wanted to take these super apostles on. Mono, imano, power, to power. And so he begins, even though he admits he didn't learn this from Christ, even though he admits that it's foolish, he still says it nonetheless. Oh, they think they're Hebrews. I am a Hebrew. Oh, they think they're Israelites. I am an Israelite. Oh, they think they're ministers of Christ. I am a minister of Christ. And if you know anybody who has any kind of passion, what you know is that as soon as they begin doing that, they don't want to stop. They want to keep going. They just want to put it in. Paul is ready right at this point. We're expecting him to keep going to say, here's all the churches that I've planted. Here's all the places that I've gone. Here's all the miracles that have occurred under my watch. You can just feel Paul. Can't you just internally wanting to just set it straight? He is wanting to blast these super apostles. And then he stops. Because rather than beginning or continuing on and beginning to list all of his accomplishments, he begins to do this. I've been imprisoned. I've had 39 lashings. I've been beaten with rods. I've been shipwrecked for days. I've been hungry and thirsty. And I'm constantly anxious. You know what? You want an image for me? Picture this, I was so scared that I was put in like a basket, like a poor little kitty cat and taken through the wall by this window and lowered down so that I could run away. As N.T. Wright points out, this whole litany of things that Paul was listing off, these would have been things that would have been embarrassing, shaming to people in the Roman Empire. They would never, no good leader would ever have admitted that all of those struggles, all of those weaknesses, all of those challenges, no, a good leader would only talk about his or her power, about all the great things that had happened. They don't have troubles. Why? Because they're miraculous super apostles. What Paul is wanting to make very clear, we need to hear this, is that you cannot separate the message from the messenger. You cannot preach a gospel that talks about picking up your cross, that talks about humility, that talks about serving and suffering from a place of glamour and pride and glory and power and eloquence and strength and popularity. You may want to do that. You may think that you can do it. But you cannot separate the message of the gospel from the messenger who is conveying that gospel. This, of course, is a passage that should leave those of us who preach into a very introspective time. I really try to wrestle this week or have wrestled. I'm not entirely sure why I picked this passage. 
But one of the things I realized is that it's a little bit of an awkward passage for a number of different reasons in this context. Uh, for one, of course, you know, this is about pastors. And so it's, it's kind of weird to, to talk about pastors in, in, in a group of folks who, for whom 99% of them aren't pastors, right? It's like going to an accountant conference if you are a doctor. It doesn't make sense. Now, someone who was an accountant told me as they left that accountant conferences are very exciting. <laughs> I've never been to one. I'm sure that it's probably the case. It's also awkward to talk about it because in order to talk about it, in some ways, I almost have to talk ill of particular super apostles in our midst. And I'm not all that keen in coming up publicly and beginning to talk about super apostles. That's uh, that, 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 that seems to be being rude or uh, uh, criticizing uh, other colleagues, which is uh, very awkward to do. Thirdly, of course, it's, it's uncomfortable for me because there's really no way for me to talk about this, at least not well, without admitting that there very well could be times, that there have been times, that there are times. When I, as a pastor or preacher, certainly lead out of some sense of ego or pride rather than humility and brokenness and suffering and sacrifice. But we need to talk about it at least briefly. Scott and Stan mention in their uh, Scott and Stan video about this passage this week, uh, they talk about how much like the Roman Empire, of course, we are also a very personality-driven culture, right? We love the personality. You see it in sports, right? Now, now I'm not one who thinks that the past were the glory days. Um, um, I, I feel myself increasingly getting like that, but that's the way everyone is, I think. But you do kind of see, there used to be, you know, it used to be about the team. And now in many ways, of course, we, we highlight more individuals, if you will, right? It happens in sports. It happens in politics. It happens in Hollywood. It happens with social media influencers, right? There's this great sense of this cultivation of the, the person. Everybody's clamoring to be, that person, to be the one that people look at, the one that people like, the one that people follow. There's this great kind of energy around that. And one of the things that we have to be mindful of, just as Paul was trying to remind the church in Corinth of, is the fact that the church almost always is tempted to echo the culture more than they echo Jesus. And so the truth, of course, is that in the church, you see this with pastors as well, super apostles, if you will. In a time of YouTube and a time of, uh, of Instagram and in a time of conferences and books, there is continually this emphasis, this focus, usually not on a church, but on particular people. If you are eloquent enough, if you are charismatic enough, if you are tweetable enough, it doesn't hurt if you are good-looking tan and have bulging biceps. If you have those things, the church oftentimes begins to want to elevate you to this next level. And we have to be mindful as Christians, to also be aware that whenever something is on a screen, it almost always makes it other. Whether or not it's a screen that you're watching from your own home, whether it's a screen in a larger venue, there is almost always, it's just implied, it's just subconscious, there's a sense of otherness, of awe, almost of holiness. It gives whatever is being said and whomever is saying it more gravitas than if it's just kind of more normal face to face. The church, now like the church in Corinth, needs to be aware of this. Now, with somebody who, who doesn't mind in, in private, of course, uh, talking to a couple of friends or uh, certainly other pastoral colleagues about this, uh, we like to get very upset, people like me, about these super apostles. And, ah, you know, they're just not, they're not really preaching the gospel, this and that. We love to do it. 
It feels righteously indignant, which there's no better feeling than feeling righteously indignant. Am I right? Man, it feels good. It doesn't take a counselor, though, to understand that a part of this is not just righteous indignation. It's jealousy as well. As much as oftentimes these super apostles in my mind make my stomach turn, I also realize that if handed that baton, I would more than likely take it and say, I think I can probably do this better in a more humble way. And so we need to be very forthright about that. I've noticed even just in my own life, just the difference between the two churches, by and large, that I've served, uh, one for six years, this one for seven and a half, just the difference even within me, the natural inclinations. The first church I've served, I talk about this, it was outskirts of Chicago, uh, um, um, that first year, especially, you know, numbers around 35, right? These were throngs of people to whom I was worshiping. Our budget was barely over what I was making, which I was not making very much. We had a staff of one other person, and she worked, I think, about 10 hours a week. We had two kids, and we were paying them because they were the pianist children. Every week, I remember this, I've talked about this before, one of my jobs was to go out and to get the trash can and get to the street and begin to carry it into the church the fact that I still remember, remember that should tell you two things. One, how humbling that was, and two, my own pride to think, why should I be doing this? But every week I was remembered when 30 or 35 people came that there weren't that many people listening to me, and it was a constant practice of humility, whether I wanted it or not. And I get to come here, you know, and there's at least a few hundred people typically. And, and well, that's fun. It's fun to have people listen, right? It's fun to have more than just 30 or 35. And I've got a staff, you know, 15 people or so. And, you know, that's kind of fun. And we get to do these things together. And, and people say, say nice things sometimes. And, and, and sometimes people even listen. Not always, but sometimes. You could just feel this kind of natural almost. I mean, it's, it, it's very common, it would seem to me, to just begin to think, well, you know what? I'm not that bad. So then for me to imagine, what would it be like if you had thousands? I cannot imagine how I would be able to handle that. So I need to be honest about that. Uh, but as long as we're talking about being honest... What we also need to understand is that Paul doesn't just talk to the super apostles. What Paul realizes is that you don't have super apostles. You don't have people who are preaching a gospel of glamour, a gospel that's not nearly as sacrificial or servanthood or full of humility. You don't have those super apostles without people who are more than happy to lift them up. This is what Paul says. Did you hear it? You may not have heard it because it's a lot more fun to hear what, when someone's criticizing someone else than when someone's criticizing us. Amen? Did you hear it? Paul says, you, and he's talking to the church. I hope you hear the sarcasm. You have such admirable tolerance for imposters who rob your freedom, rip you off, steal you blind, put you down, slap your face. And then he says again to them, since you admire the egomaniacs of the pulpit so much. As Ben Witherington points out, the Corinthians were so enamored with these images of leadership in their culture that they were missing out on the fact that they weren't reflecting the image of Christ. You cannot disconnect the message from the messenger. Someone else had said, we in the church are often drawn to models of cultural power and prestige. The church continually falls asleep to the ways in which they are simply consuming the culture including a culture that is more than happy to lift up super apostles 
And Paul is trying to wake them up. As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a, of a story that my wife told me several years ago. She was with a group of ladies uh, from different churches. And a woman was telling her the story. One of the women was talking, and she said, you know, I was at the mall the other day. Great. And I saw my pastor. He was in workout clothes. He must have just got done working out. That was the end of the story. You see, Megan, first of all, had anticipated that she was going to go somewhere. Like, oh, I saw him. He was like caring for his family or he was caring for somebody in need or he was doing something. I don't know, something. And one of the other women in the group said, well, did you go up and talk to him? Oh, no. I could never just go up and talk to him. That should grieve the church. Paul longs for them to wake up to how they are feeding into the culture of their society rather than seeing that the gospel of humility, the gospel of sacrifice and servanthood and, sa- and weakness cannot be separated from a messenger who speaks in words that seem to reveal more about power and popularity and ego and power. So what are we to do? Well, if I was just speaking to pastors, so Scott, I'm just going to talk to you because I've noticed your pride of late. (laughs) Those of you who know Pastor Scott know that that is not true. We need to be aware of how easily our pride especially in this culture, can begin to take over. One of the things that we have to do, it seems to me, is surround ourselves with people who are entirely unimpressed by us. You guys, by and large, do a really good job of that. (laughs) I didn't need that amen. One of the interesting things in the Roman Empire, whenever you had an emperor or a general who was very popular and who was coming through and there were throngs of crowds, thousands all lined up who were cheering how wonderful they were, what a great accomplishment uh, they had made. There was someone else in the chariot, a servant usually, and they would be whispering in the general or the emperor's ear, you too are mortal. You too are mortal. You too are mortal. As a way of constantly reminding them that while their role may have been different or unique, it made them no different, no better than anyone else. Second thing I want to say is this, and I'm going to be as blunt as I possibly can be, and if I am wrong, may the Lord forgive me. If when you see your pastor and you begin to get butterflies in your stomach, or you begin to feel like you are in the presence of a celebrity, then you should run. Get to another place, whether it is the pastor's fault or not. It doesn't matter. But the truth is that that pastor for whom you have elevated, all of a sudden, they are not able to point you to whom they should worship. Rather, they are pointing them to you as if you should worship them. And for the goodness of the gospel and your own life and your own soul, I would encourage you to run. One of the things I said right before I went off on sabbatical a few weeks before that, I was reminded of it again and again this week was, that the best Bible teachers you should have 
should never be a preacher. Not a super apostle, not a semi super apostle, not an apostle. It should be those with whom you know them well and you know their lives. Here's what I mean. Think about this week, Lisa Klingen Peel. Some of you know Lisa, some of you don't. She was the one who would always come in in the wheelchair. She'd usually sit back there. There was someone back there helping her. She would come in and she would have this smile on her face, though she was bound, though she had all of these physical difficulties. She had this smile on her face. I want you to know this. I have never understood what the joy of the Lord is from any preacher like I could understand it from Lisa Klingenpeel. Or we mourn the loss of Ron Baker. And I was reflecting on this and remembering Nancy, who really, let's be honest, without, she, without Nancy, this place would go under, ZPC would. But I know that over the last several years, and she why won't be happy with me saying this, but she has served her husband going in and out of the hospital and medical uh, appointments. She has served him beautifully well. I have never learned about what it means to be a servant more from her than from any of the greatest preachers of our time. Wanda Baker who helped to found this church with her husband, Leroy, and, and all the work that she had done, and to see her faithfulness and her love for the church. I have never understood as much about faithfulness from any of the greatest preachers as I did from Wanda. If we want to be a people who are shaped like Jesus, if we want to be a people who do not give in to the pressures of our community, the pressures of our culture, who will tell us it's about convenience, it's about power, it's about prestige, it's about followers, we will never learn outside of a community of faith. You cannot get it from the greatest of preachers. It is impossible. If it is not something that we are living with, and within a community of faith. When Paul wrote this letter, he was not writing it to some man named Corinth or some woman named Corinthia. He was writing it to a community, the Corinthian church. Why? Because as we'll see next week in Galatians, Paul understood that to be shaped, it takes a community to be shaped differently than the world around you. It is not because you have some great, wonderful, eloquent, charismatic preacher. It is because of the fact that you are willing to live day in and day out, week in and week out with real people. People who force you to learn what it means to be patient because they're so annoying. People who force you to understand what it means to be gentle because you just want to do something less than gentle. People say, I left the church because it was full of hypocrites. In my own mind, you should run to a church that is full of weak people because it will help you to understand more about what it means to follow the gospel. So as I was thinking about that, I realized that I also wanted to say something to some of our folks, mostly our folks who are at home right now. And I understand I'm going to be as careful as I can be about this. This is a hard time. COVID is a hard time. Politics are a hard time. Our community is a hard time. Afghanistan, what's going on across the globe, there's all these things. Just living right now seems to take a ton of energy. We don't know what to expect. We don't know what's happening next. It is exhausting. And so I want to be very careful because I don't want to be judgmental, but I also want to be very clear that it would be weird for a pastor to not talk about the importance of gathering together as sisters and brothers in Christ. Wouldn't that be weird? It would be weird, it seems to me. I know that there are lots of reasons why people aren't gathering together in worship, and I don't want to speak to all of those. For some of you who are struggling for whatever vulnerability you may have, that it's just not wise for you to come in here, I'm not talking to you, you can shut it down. But for the rest of us, I want, to, I want to speak to two groups. First, I want to speak to those of you who have decided that because of the fact that we are mandating masks, that you are not going to come as long as we have that mandate. I want to say, first of all, I hate masks. It's not so much because I 
can't breathe. I can breathe pretty well in them, actually. It's more of just, I like seeing your faces. It's no fun to preach without seeing your faces. It's no fun to see one another without seeing their faces. I get it. I hate masks. But I love you. And while I understand that there is that desire, and I get it, to want to take a stand, what I'm going to ask you to do is not try to understand why we made this mandate as a session. I don't expect that I can help you or that you will ever agree with us on this. But I am asking you to set it aside. Not as a sign that you agree with us, but as a sign that you will let nothing, not even a string and some cloth, separate you from this body. As a sign that though the culture around us may be divided by COVID, we will not You know, I love it when people come here on Sunday mornings and I know that they agree with me on things or they agree with the session on things. I love it. That's great. That's wonderful. But I am in awe when people come in spite of the fact that they disagree with us. Because it points to something much larger than any of us. Secondly, much like I did several months ago, and I will probably continue to do this because it feels like it's the call of a pastor, I want to speak to those who mostly are doing everything they did before COVID, but just aren't coming in here. Now, let me be very clear. I just got done with three months on sabbatical, which meant for 12, 13, 14 Sunday mornings, I didn't have to go anywhere. It was amazing. I get it. Sleep feels good. Coffee feels good. Jammies and slippers feel real good. We could just relax. We didn't have to wrestle the kids out. We could sit there on our sofa if we wanted to and watch worship. It was great. But I also want to suggest that, quite frankly, it is not enough to actually wake us up. Just watching the video of somebody preach or somebody sing is not enough to wake us up from our slumber. In fact, I would suggest the very thing that we don't oftentimes want to do, which is to get up, which is to get the kids ready, which is to get out of our pajamas and our slippers, that very act of sacrifice is exactly the kind of act that leads to shaping us into a different kind of people. That in so doing, we are standing up to the culture around us that says what matters is what's convenient. What matters is just simply what is enjoyable all the time. What matters is what comes just kind of naturally. Rather, it says, no, we are going to say to ourselves and to our children, to our neighbors and to those we drive by, that what matters is what Jesus Christ would call us to. What matters is being together as sisters and brothers in Christ. What matters is being shaped less like the culture around us and more like the one who suffered and died for us. The church in Corinth needed to wake up and they needed one another. The church has always been and will always be tempted by the culture that surrounds us. The church churches will always fail at this. Pastors will always fail at this. What Jesus longs for are not a people who are perfect, but he does long for a people who will be roused from their slumber. A people who are willing to admit their own weaknesses and struggles. Because it is in that weakness in which the strength of God so amazingly works. 
sisters and brothers in Christ. May we learn what it means to live and to lead, not with power or success or pride, but with vulnerability, with humility, and with sacrifice. May it be so. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, the message that we are called to give at times is not always the message that we long to give. And it's certainly not often the message that we long to hear. We are not a perfect church. I am certainly not a perfect pastor. But make us a people who are willing to confess. A people willing to admit that we struggle at times with humility and with serving. That we would prefer the easier road. And in so doing, God, might we look more and more like you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Show. Sure.
Amen. Please stand. Sisters and brothers in Christ, I'm not going to belabor these points that I've already made, so let me just say this. Thank you. Thank you for the ways in which you teach me, the ways in which you teach Pastor Scott. You all are beautiful reflections, apostles, if you will, of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And so maybe we continue to be brothers and sisters who are shaping one another, challenging one another, encouraging one another, that we, we might more and more reflect Jesus and less the culture around us. Amen? So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and until Jesus returns. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen.